Don't you love this time of year? Yes. Celebrate the Lord. Christmas season. It's always just a great time. In fact, this message today that we'll be sharing with you is about uh, one of those, I think one of the most profound theological, doctrinal things that we'll find in Scripture. And it's concerning when God literally becomes a man. And I think sometimes we just, we're so focused on the fact that Jesus is God, he's the Lord, he's the Savior, he's the King of Kings, the, you know, and we just get focused on the deity of Christ. Sometimes we forget about the humanity of Christ. And so we'll look at some of that today. And in fact, I'm going to take just a little snippet of scripture from Hebrews chapter 2. Think of all the places in the world to go to for a Christmas message. But there is this tremendous message of Christmas in Hebrews chapter 2, just about three or four verses there that talk about the, this miracle of God becoming a man. We call it the incarnation of Christ, where God literally clothes himself with humanity. And the heart of what Hebrews is telling us here is, is the reasoning behind that. In fact, in these few verses that we'll look at in Hebrews today, is, there's five reasons we'll look at here why God becomes a man. Why do we see this great incarnation? What, what is the, what's the divine plan of all that's going on? Uh, you know, we talk about the Lord of salvation. He's the Lord of creation. He's the Lord of uh, all dominion. But now we look at today, I want to just look at the fact that the Lord in his incarnation, where God literally comes and takes on human form and becomes one of us. So as we look at this passage, let's start with Hebrews chapter 2, where it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, that's us, you know, we, we're all flesh and blood, we're humanity, that it says he, talking about Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that's the devil, and deliver them who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him that nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Now again, there's just this great passage of scripture that talks about, when you start breaking it down, why did God take on the form of a man? Why did he send his son Jesus to take on the, this form of humanity? And just, just these few verses just blow out in this great theological doctrinal truth of, of the word of God. So simple, it's so profound. So let's look at this today as we just kind of lay out the five reasons as he does in the, in the chronological order that he, that he lays them out in here in scripture. The first reason he talks about, he becomes a man for the plundering of Satan. Verse 17, he says, just as, as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Why? That through death, in other words, unless he becomes a man, he can't die. Does that make sense? God has to become a man, so he clothes himself with humanity. Now, the words here in this passage, there's two words that kind of stand out. One is, is this partakers, and the other word is, is the word where it talks about uh, not just partaking, but it, it goes into the idea of uh, taking part in. The first word there for, for this partakers of fellowship together is a word that we're familiar with. We've talked about it many times in the Greek language, and it's the word for it's the word for for communion, it's the word for fellowship. That it means to share in a common life and to share in a common, common, common interest and common goals. Now, if you're a Christian, you have fellowship with every other Christian. You may be different in a lot of ways, but you are uniquely the same in this regard. And that's what gives us fellowship. We can come from different places, different backgrounds, different cultures. All over the world, there's people today that are worshiping God, that love Jesus. And no matter where they are, who they are, what tribe they come from, we have fellowship one with another, all right? That's koinonia that we experience because God has made us common. But even without God, we still have things in common. We're humanity. We're, we're men and women. We're all made the same way. We're all created by God and created as human beings. We all share in that together. We all have flesh and blood in common. So we're all like this. And we're very also common in the fact that when we're born, we're born with a nature. Because of Adam's sin, we know that's a fallen nature. So that's another way that we all fellowship. But I love it where it says, you know, we have this fellowship. We are partakers. We fellowship in flesh and blood. 
but it says he himself also likewise took part of the same. That partook is the word that's used in the, in the King James Version then. And it's a little different from this fellowship mindset. It has to do with something or taking a hold of something that is not naturally of your kind. In other words, God is spirit. That's not like flesh and blood, would you agree? But God in spirit, God's son comes and partakes in flesh and blood. In other words, he takes upon and adds to his nature something that is not naturally part of his nature. He becomes a man. This is, this is an incredible moment in time. It's an incredible moment in history when, when, when God becomes a man and he does it by sending his son Jesus to the virgin birth of Mary and he's born God and he's not any less God, but now God is clothed with humanity. Now he tells us why he does that. Why, why does this have to happen? He says, so he can die. You, you can't kill God in God form, all right? He's God. So God takes on the form of a man so that he can die, but not just die, so that he can die for you, so that he can die in your place. You know, we are by nature flesh and blood. We're going to die, all right? But it, it, not in the nature of God to die because God is life. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. So something has to happen within his very nature and makeup so that he can be this offering for our sin. What has to happen? He has to become a man. He has to become a human being. Why does he have to do that? So that he can destroy the work of the devil. So that he can overcome the enemy and destroy what Satan's done. Now it doesn't mean when he talks about destroying him who had this power over us in the context of just obliterating, annihilating, and he no longer exists. It doesn't mean cease to exist. The literally, it, the terminology has to deal with of, uh, destroying in such a way to, to annul whatever authority, whatever power he had. So Christ comes to destroy the authority of the enemy over our life. Now Satan's going to live forever in hell, in a pit, right? But what has happened to us because... Adam gave up in the garden and submitted his will and gave his, his life over to the, to the desire of his flesh and of Satan for his life. He gave up the keys and what happened at that point, we know that death entered a pen upon all men. So what does Jesus come and do? He comes and destroys the one who has this power of death, uh, this, this tool, this weapon over us called death. He deals with him by becoming human flesh and blood and takes it and wrestles it from him. I mean, this greatest supreme weapon that the devil has against you in the end is your eternal death. Uh, now, we cope no because of sin when we're, when we're born in this life. We're all born and one day we're going to die. I hate to tell you that, but you're going to die. You know, it, just don't get upset. It's going to happen. Every one of us are going to face death. The only way you'll get out of that is by the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says when he comes and the, and the dead are raised in, in, into victory and resurrection comes, if you're still alive at that point, it says then those who remain, he'll catch up in the air as well to be with him. And he'll glorify us in that moment. But otherwise, the exit door for you, if you're a Christian, to get into heaven is now the grave. It's not the entrance door into eternity of pain and misery and hell and death. So what Satan, because of sin, he's had this power of death over us. And not just a, in the context of a physical death, sin opened the door for all that, but it also opened the door up into the spiritual death. The moment that Adam and Eve sinned against God, they died spiritually, all right? And now every person who's ever born is born spiritually dead. Oh, they're soullessly alive, mind, will, emotions, you know, capacity to think, reason, breathe, you know, they function biologically. We're alive in that way, but we're dead in our spirit. And that's why Jesus comes. He says, I've come that you might have life. Well, people are sitting there saying, what do you mean you've come that I might have life? I'm alive. Well, you're alive physically. But you don't possess real life and real life comes through knowing Jesus personally. And what happens is your spirit is brought to life. That's why Jesus said you must be 
born again. You've been born physically. Now you need another spiritual, uh, uh, another birth, but it's a spiritual birth now. And that happens when you give your, your, your heart, your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. A miracle takes place and you're born alive now. And, and now the whole thing about death and this tool that Satan has against you, it, it's no longer a weapon. It's, it's really a useless weapon. So Jesus comes and in him already is eternal life. All right. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is everything that life is. The only thing that would be stronger than the power of death is eternal life. And that's, thus enters Jesus into the scene. Thus he enters in, in that manger in Bethlehem. Here is life. All right? The way God intended man to live, man alive with God in him. All right? Now here's God surrounded with the flesh and, and, and humanity of men, and he comes so that he can take our place and overcome death. So now I don't have to be afraid of physical death, but certainly have to be afraid of, of eternal death. Spiritual death is dealt with when I give my life to Jesus. Eternal death is dealt with when I give my life to Jesus. The only other death I have to face is now, well, Paul said to be absent his body, be present with the Lord. You know, is that issue. So the Lord shows up to destroy him who holds the power of death. How does he do it? He's life. That's how he does it. It's like going to war and, and, and the, your commander gives you a bow and an arrow and the enemy walks on the stage and he's got a submachine gun. You're in trouble. All right? You're in trouble. His weapons overpower you. Life overpowers death. Jesus, eternal life, God life overpowers death. And so here comes Jesus onto the scene. He rests from the devil, the power of death. His enemy, the enemy's weapons are not powerful enough to deal with him. And at the grave of Jesus, three days later, we see this resurrection, supernatural power take place and it raises Jesus from the dead. He experiences death. He has to become a human. So he experiences death on our behalf and pays the price for our sin. You know, I said it a few weeks ago, and, and I really believe that even when I said it, such a simple statement, there's such an anointing in it and such power in it when you say it, if you hear it. And let me just say it again, but let me add one element to it. I said a few weeks ago, someone had to die for you. Let me just let that sit a little bit, all right? Someone had to die for you, all right? But anyone is not good enough. I can't die for you. You know, I can't pay the price for your sin. Why? Because I'm sinful. And what has to be presented is a sinless sacrifice. Somebody who doesn't deserve a payment on their own of death. Jesus didn't. He was sinless. All right. He who knew no sin. He goes to the cross and becomes your sin. So I couldn't die for you. So when you think about the fact that someone had to die for you, remember who it was. God's son had to die for you. That's a big price for you, for me. And I think if we don't let that soak in a little bit personally, we miss the whole point of it. Someone had to die for me and it had to be God's son. God himself comes and gives himself up in the, in the form of his son and dies for my sins. And he wrestles from the devil, the one who has the power of sin and death, and he takes it from him. Jesus went in that passage in John 14, when he's talking about the resurrection, the power of the life. He, he, in verse 19, he says, because I live, you shall live. Because I'm, you know, because I'm life, you can have life. I'm going to give you what you can't give yourself, what you can't do for yourself. So I'm going to do for you what you can't even do for yourself in the form of giving myself to pay for your sin. You can't even pay for your own sin. You spend eternity. The only way to pay for your own sin is you spend eternity in hell. And there's no end to that. So you're not, you know, the debt's never paid. So someone comes and takes your place and he says, he came, he becomes a man, this incarnation takes place, this resurrection takes place so that we can have eternal life. And life takes and wrestles from the enemy, the power that he's held over us. Now the second reason here, that uh, I've already shared those two scriptures, going. the second reason is, is the peace of the saints. What do you mean? This plays hand in hand. He says that he might deliver those who, who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Most Anybody you meet on the streets, if you'll spend enough time with them sooner or later, they'll get around to the fact, say, yeah, I don't really want to, I, I don't want to face death. I'm afraid to die. Most people are afraid to die. Unless you meet somebody who loves Jesus. Yes. 
You know, when you meet somebody who's got this issue settled, hey, I've given my life to Christ. I couldn't save myself. He saved me. I couldn't work for it. I couldn't deserve it. Couldn't earn it. It's mercy. It's grace. I've trusted him. He's paid the price for my sins. And because, because of that, you know, when I die, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be a big deal. It's a doorway for me. All right. It's just a, it's, it's, it's the curtain I walk past to get in to the next life. And that next life is the eternal life. And, and that's the life where Jesus rules and reigns. I mean, the thing that terrifies people most today is, is death. It's a fear. In fact, someone once called it, it is so horrible, we call it the king of terrors. Not for the believer. We've been released from that torment. We've been released from the bondage to fear, to death. In fact, if you're in your right spiritual mind, you'll look forward to it. Amen? <laughs> Amen? Amen. You'll look forward to it. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm ready to go, but I'm not ready to go right now. <laughs> hey, bring it, on. bring it on. It looks good to me. It's, I know it'll beat what we got going here. <laughs> Wouldn't take much to beat what we got going on around here. Amen. It's glorious. It's a great, we're, not, it, we're not afraid. It's like Paul said, oh, death, where's your victory? Where's your sting? It, no, there's no longer capacity to terrorize me. Simply for me, all that death is, it just releases me into the very presence of God. For to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So this is one of the great reasons for the incarnation of Christ. Men are held in bondage, he said, all their lives until Jesus comes along. Let me ask you, if, you're, if you knew this afternoon at 303 you were going to die, oh, how would that work for you? What would you be experiencing in your life, your mind? Would it be a lot of fear? Terror? You wouldn't have to if you're a believer. He said, let me take care of a few final arrangements here. 303 is coming up pretty quick, whatever it is. I need to take care of some issues. Say some goodbyes. But for the believer, that's, it's, it's not an issue of fear because we placed our hands into the hands of the one who's conquered death and hell and the grave and who reigns supreme. It wouldn't have happened, though, if he hadn't become a man. If he hadn't become lower than the angels and stepped down into time and space where we are and saved us and delivered us. That's the second reason. For, the third reason is this, for the performance of scriptures. He talks about in this passage in verses 17 where he says, you know, he says, your children, your partakers of flesh and blood. He himself becomes a partaker of the same that through death he might destroy him with the power of death. That's the devil and deliver us. Basically he's talking about here that the Lord did this because it behooved him to do so. That he would render powerless the, the you, know, you know, the enemy of God, that we would, we would be set free and we would have freedom, but it's the performance of scriptures is what this really gets down to. God said he would do it. That's why he did it. Because God said he would. Whereby he is the seed of Abraham. What made him the seed of Abraham? God promised Abraham that he would come. There was a promise made to Abraham that the Messiah would come through his seed and through his lineage. And that's why the scripture says, wherefore, you know, it says it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. The behooved means obligation. Jesus came, became a man because he was obligated to. Why was he obligated to? Because he told Abraham he was going to do it. You say, well, why did he choose the Jews? Listen, if he chose anybody else, we'd be asking the same question. Why did he choose them? <laughs> he chose them out of love. Someone through the sovereignty of God was going to be the delivering mechanism for Messiah to come. And so God chose the Jews. In fact, late in early scriptures, Moses is warning them in, in Deuteronomy about this, this, this divine grace upon their lives. He says, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people. You were the fewest of all people. The Lord did this because the Lord loved you. And he kept an oath by which he swore to his forefathers. Notice, God did what he did because he said he would do it. He did it the way he did it because that's in the sovereignty to do it. But he, there was a motivating force behind it all. And that's because he loved people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God becomes a man because he said he would do it. And because he said he would do it, he keeps his word. He delivers on what he said he would do just out of his sovereignty. And this is beautiful because you think about that. Well, God becomes a man because he promised Abraham he would do that. And so it happens. And now salvation for all men is available. And that's good news. That means I can trust God's word. The beautiful thing about prophecy is we can just see the faithfulness of God over and over and over again. All those things, hundreds of prophecies about Jesus were fulfilled in scripture. God promised him they happened. I mean, even where he'd be born was promised. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ was born. 
Even that he would be, have to flee and, and, and for, uh, to Egypt, that was all prophesied. How he would die was prophesied. Everything was laid out. So we understand very clearly that God is faithful to his word and will perform what he promised to do. That ought to make you excited because God said, if you would repent and believe, you'd be saved. Someone says, how do you know you're saved? Because God made a promise. That's it. Boom. Bottom line. Not because you've experienced something. No. Not because you felt something. No. Not because you prayed a certain prayer. No. I put my faith in Jesus. Amen. And God's faithful to his word. So God, ultimately we see this, the incarnation of Christ because God's faithful to the performance of the scriptures. Number four even gets gr as good as the others. Amen. And number four, the scriptures tell us, that he did this so that he might become the priest that would sympathize on our behalf. He did it to become a priest for us and a sympathetic and a merciful priest, this passage tells us. Now, a priest is someone who stands before God to represent people, all right? And he represents God to the people and he represents the people before God. All right. And that's what the priesthood was all about, doing ministry to, of worship to the Lord and standing there in behalf and, and on, on behalf of the people. Now, Jesus, the reason we don't need any priest today is because Jesus is our high priest. All right. And he makes us all priests so I can go to God myself. I don't need anybody to go to God on my behalf for me. I have Jesus there to do it for me. He's my lawyer, he's my brother, he's my advocate. Everything I need is in him. And the glorious truth of all this is that he knows me. And he knows what I've experienced and he knows what I feel and he knows what, I, what I'm going through. He has become a man. He's been dealing with the same issues in his humanity that I deal with in my humanity. He faced the same issues and problems in one way or another that I face in my life. The things that you deal with, he dealt with. He dealt with every temptation. But the difference is between me, you, and him is that he succeeded in every temptation. He overcame in every temptation. And the Bible tells us that he just doesn't come that to prove his, that he's God, that he's deity, but he also faced all these things in the flesh that he might sympathize with us. So we would have this sympathetic high priest. A great illustration of this is, is the Apostle Paul when he's writing to Timothy. And he's telling Timothy in 2 Timothy, uh, he talks to him about, you know, his his conduct. He talks to him about uh, issues. He talks to him about how to deal with his critics. He talks to him about moral conduct and spiritual ethics. And, and he deals with all these issues. And he's talking to him about the things he's going through. And, and, and he says in verse 8, he says, Now, Timothy, remember Christ Jesus and his humanity. What is he saying? Timothy, remember, no matter how tough it gets and all you have to deal with and what, what, where, where you are in your life, Jesus has been there. He knows what rejection is like. He knows what it's like to be forsaken. He knows what it's like to be lied about. He knows what it's like to be hurt. He knows what it's like to be sped upon. He knows what it's like. He faced everything that you're facing one way or another and, and probably even more so. You say, why more so? Well, when I'm tempted, well, it, you know, I'm an easy target and so are you for the devil. We have, he has this inside helper called my flesh. Come on. Amen. <laughs> got, got, got some inside help going on. But Jesus... He was pure. And so every temptation against him, and we see even the temptations of Christ, the wilderness, every temptation, you know, most people, they give in to temptation long before it gets severe. I mean, if Satan tempts you, if that doesn't work, what's he do? He come back and tries again, doesn't he? Doesn't he? You, you, you go by that, what's he do? He comes back and tries again, right? Does he ever quit? No. no. Most people give in long before the, the extreme part, though, right? Jesus stayed all the way to the end. So I believe probably the temptations he experienced were probably even on a higher degree than what we can even understand or begin to comprehend in our little human brains. But he, he walked through it and he walked through it victoriously. So he has taken our place. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. And this verse eight basically says, remember he's the descendant of David. He's a human. Remember, he's, remember you can go to him. Remember you can pray to him. He has become your sympathizer and he's a merciful sympathizer. He's your faithful high priest. What does that mean? <coughs> to be a sympathizer means that if I'm hungry, 
He's been hungry. He knows what it's like to be hungry. He knows what it's like to be thirsty. He knows what it's like to be overcome with weariness or fatigue. He, he, he slept. He, he was taught. He grew. He loved. He, he, he cared. He was astonished. He was rejected. He was glad. He was angry. He was indignant. He was sarcastic. He was grieved. He was troubled. He was always doing all this without sin. But he experienced all those things in every situation. He had to do what you and I have to do. What? You, he trusted the Father. He could have even acted independently of his own because he's God. But he didn't. He, said, he said, everything I do, I'm just doing obedience to the Father. What I speak, I'm just speaking what the Father said. What I do is just what the Father told me. In other words, that's faith life. He said, I just live by faith. I trust the Father. In other words, when you say, well, Jesus, I have to live by faith. He says, good, I understand that. But Lord, it's difficult. I understand that. But Lord, people are rejecting me. I understand that. I know how that feels. I can sympathize with that. And it's one thing for me to, to, to know that you're in a situation. In counseling, a lot of times this happens, and Brother Tim, we relate to this. People, people experience things, sometimes things that I have had to deal with. And sometimes they're dealing with stuff that I haven't dealt with. All right? And I find it much easier to sympathize with the ones who've gone through the things I've gone through. Not, the Bible even says that. You'll comfort others with the comfort you've been comforted with, right? And in the, that's why a lot of times in counseling, we like to direct people we counsel to someone who has walked where they're walking in a crisis or situation. So we move them towards those people and try to connect, say, here's somebody who knows exactly. That's just a unique way to sympathize with those situations and those needs and people. Well, understand Jesus is that one in reality who, who can ultimately sympathize with everything because he went through everything. And I probably, I believe my own heart and mind, you know, even to a greater degree because he had never sinned. He took the full measure of every situation, of every temptation, but he was victorious in every way. Now, question is, why did he do that? Why did he do that? He did it so that he could be your merciful and your high priest who could sympathize with you in the midst of your torment or your weakness, come to the aid of you when you're tempted and minister to you in every situation. It's not some cosmic God that's out there on the other side of the universe we serve. It's a God who loves us, who's here with us, who's present with us, who's walked where we've walked. Uh, he, he's our savior. He's our substitute, but he's our perfect savior and our perfect substitute. He's the author of our salvation. He is our salvation. He's the Satan conqueror. He's our sympathizer. He's our high priest. We can go to him with everything. What a savior. No one else like that. No other religion presents anything like that. Because that's just men at their best trying to somehow appease God. When God came and on our behalf appeased God for us by giving himself up. Which leads me to the fifth point of what we're talking about here. And all these are inter inter intermingled, obviously. In verse 17, it talks about in order that he might make reconciliation for, for the sins of the people. Well, that's what the Bible tells us in, in 2 Corinthians 5 when it says, hey, hey, therefore, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by his son Christ Jesus. What's he saying here? God became a man to die for your sins so you could know God. The only way you can do that is have your sins dealt with, your sins paid for. God's a just God. Sin has to be dealt with. So God deals with your sin and my sin through his son. Through his son. There's no, there's no really greater hymn in regard to this that, that really lays it out. It's that old gospel that says, Alas, and did my Savior bleed? And did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Now, if you look at the old hymn books, it says worm. Hymn books in the 60s and 70s changed that worm to sinner. All right. For such as sinners, that doesn't even fit syllabically, all right? Is that a word, syllabically? <laughs> doesn't fit. So they changed that later to, to newer hymn books say, For such a one as I. Well, folks, you're more than a one. You're a zero. <laughs> With the rim kicked off. <laughs> We're a worm. That's the way, in, in contrast, in comparison, to the holy God, we're just a worm. And that's so eloquently, and scriptures say that even in Isaiah. He said, alas, and did my savior bleed and would my sovereign die for such a worm as I? Remember the song goes on to say, but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. In other words, in other words you can't cry enough. You can't be sorry enough. You can't be good enough. You can't try hard enough. It's not gonna pay the debt. 
Ultimately, the hymn writer says, so here, Lord, I just give myself away. That's all I can do. Ultimately, he's done it all. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, can't hear you, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was thereby I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. What a Savior. So you see in this passage the simple five reasons for, it just, in a, just a, in a little nutshell of a verse of why Satan was plundered. I don't have to let him run me over. I don't have to, I don't have to yield my life to him. I don't have to yield to temptation. The, the peace of the saints, I don't have to live with fear anymore. The performance of scripture, the Messiah had to come, be born of the seed of Abraham. That should bring us to humility instead of arrogance and humble ourselves to God. He's the priest that sympathizes. I don't have to spend my time complaining about how hard things are. I can just take it to my heavenly father and my savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and pour my heart out to him and find what I need in the, in the hour of my need. And ultimately the payment of our sins. Have I repented? I remember reading this little clip, and I may have even shared this before. Uh, in, in 25 years, 26 years of preaching to you, I'm sure I repeat myself a lot. Hey, but if you can deal with it, your wife, you can put up with me. Uh, <laughs> it was in 1903. Now, I wasn't alive then. I think Frank was. Uh, <laughs> in 1903, you remember the Wright brothers' first airplane, first flight. After many, many attempts, the Wright brothers finally succeeded in, in getting their flying machine, they called it, off the ground. And they were so thrilled, they telegraphed their sister a message. Their sister's name was Katrina, or Catherine, and they, they wrote Catherine this, this, this telegram. It says, Catherine, we have actually flown 120 feet. We'll be home by Christmas. I mean, she's pumped 100. It's amazing. She runs down to tell the newspaper editor this great story, this great news event, and the newspaper guy, editor, he looks at it, and when she shows me, he glances, oh, how nice. The boys will be home for Christmas. <laughs> Just miss the message. For the first time in history, we have flown 120 feet. What's next? Unbelievable news is breaking. Oh, the boys will be home for Christmas. That's kind of like I feel today at different times. And we're telling faith, the Savior's born. It's Christmas. The message of hope and the gospel of salvation. All men can come to Christ. We can be free from our sins. And have a God who loves us and walk with him in victory. We don't have to be bound and defeated by fear anymore of death. Oh, it's Christmas. What are you getting for Christmas? What are you giving for Christmas? And we just, it's like the present that goes unopened every year. <laughs> it's Christ himself. That's the message of Christmas. There, it's just laid out right there on the screen for you. You don't know what Christmas is all about? And I tell you, the generation that we live in today doesn't know this story. They don't know it. You'd be surprised how very few people really know the true meaning of Christmas. But you are God's instrument to let it be not only heard, but to let it be seen. Let's stand with our heads bowed.